for coming today. So we're coming to you from the McMaster Health Forum at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. This is the latest in a series of uh, webinars and presentations that are being conducted by our Queen Elizabeth Scholars in Strengthening Health Systems. Uh, just to give you a quick summary of uh, what's going to happen today, I'm going to give you a quick little summary of what the forum is, what the program, the scholarship program is all about. Then I'm going to introduce you to our guest speaker, who is Christopher Galano, who's going to be talking to you about the work that he did while he was in Sydney, Australia over the summer. And then we'll have an opportunity for questions at the end. For those of you that are here in the room, uh, you're free to ask those questions uh, when I ask them. If you're joining us online, please put your questions in the, in the chat box when the time comes. So the McMaster Health Forum is the leading hub for improving health outcomes through collective problem solving. We aim to harness information, convene stakeholders, and prepare action-oriented leaders. We act as an agent of change by empowering stakeholders. The Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program is a run through the partnership between Rideau Hall Foundation, Community Foundations of Canada, Universities Canada, and Canadian Universities. The main goal is to Activate a dynamic community of young global leaders across the Commonwealth to, last, to create lasting impacts both at home and abroad through cross-cultural exchanges encompassing international education, discovery and inquiry, and professional experiences. Here at the forum, our specific program has to do with the mandate of the forum, which is strengthening health systems. So that means that all of our scholars will contribute to strengthening health systems and become part of our large and growing network of health system leaders. Forms current Queen Elizabeth scholars. We have three incoming scholars, two outgoing scholars, and currently eight outgoing interns. Today is Christopher Galano. He is currently in the Masters of Science program in global health at McMaster University. Uh, to foster his interest in global health and health systems, he previously traveled to Peru to help build a library and kitchen at a local elementary school. He also traveled to China to learn how the Chinese healthcare system combines traditional and Western medicine. Chris has now turned his attention to knowledge translation and the use of research evidence to inform policy decision making. Chris, over to you. Thank you, James. Hi, everyone. Uh, so today I'll be talking about systems approaches to preventing lifestyle-related chronic disease. So for my internship, I got to travel to Sydney, Australia to work with the Sachs Institute um, it was a great time. Here's a picture of Sydney from the ferry. So there's the Opera House, behind that the CBD, the Central Business District, and to the left the Royal Botanic Gardens. And for me it was really interesting because Sydney felt like at the same time the most familiar yet most foreign place I've ever traveled. Walking through the CBD could have been walking through Toronto. But then you go to the Botanic Gardens and there's these exotic trees and wild parrots. So it felt like a tropical version of Canada to me, which was really interesting. And while there, I worked with the Australian Prevention Partnership Center, hosted by the Sachs Institute. So the Pre Prevention Center um, is a national initiative looking at systems approaches to preventive health. And they also look at bridging research and policy to translate knowledge into action. While I was there, my work focused on developing a resource library of systems approaches to preventive health. So gathering documents from organizations and governments who have tried systems approaches. And then I developed a systems, or sorry, a synopsis document um, reviewing some key resources and highlighting their insights into systems work. And while I was there, I was also fortunate enough to be able to attend many seminars and meet with researchers from across the Prevention Center. I also had the opportunity to travel to Melbourne and Canberra to learn about the work that the Prevention Center is doing in those cities. And it's those seminars and discussions with researchers that inform much of this presentation. So for this presentation, I'll start off talking about chronic disease and early efforts to address it, or a systems approach, and review systems approach, and review some systems tools we can use. Then I'll look at chronic disease through a systems lens, and using that information, how we can support lifestyle change to reduce risks of chronic disease. And then I'll end with some insights into how we can make it all work. So starting with chronic disease, it's widespread in developed countries like Australia and Canada. This is another similarity we share. One particularly prevalent chronic disease is heart disease. In 2012, the Australian Bureau of Statistics reported that 1 million Australians were living with heart disease. In Canada in 2009, the public health agency reported 1.6 million were living with heart disease. And these numbers include those living with the effects of stroke. And 
it's also important to note that these are from self-reports, so the chances are the numbers are actually higher. And um, other chronic diseases like diabetes are also becoming prevalent. And this is problematic because of the burden it places on society. So, for example, heart disease is a leading cause of death. And chronic diseases impair people's quality of life. Uh, they also place a heavy burden on the healthcare system. So I remember in Australia speaking with a healthcare professional, emergency rooms are filled with people coming in for problems related to chronic disease. Um, and I'm aware it's a similar situation here in Canada. And that can be really costly. There's also the indirect economic burden because chronic burden because chronic disease um, can impair workforce productivity. But we can prevent chronic disease through adopting a healthy lifestyle. So unhealthy behaviors like being physically inactive or having a poor diet significantly increase our risk of developing chronic disease. So if instead we become healthier, um, become physically active, adopt a healthier diet, we can lower our risk of developing chronic disease. And these healthy behaviors are also beneficial for those who already have chronic disease. Accordingly, early efforts focused on encouraging lifestyle change, mostly through awareness and education and early detection of risk factors with follow-up through um, the medical care system. So we see here a poster saying, risk and early death, just do nothing, raising awareness about being overly sedentary and the negative consequences. Or our kids are drowning in sugar, protect kids from obesity and diabetes, give them water instead of sugary drinks. Again, raising awareness about the negative consequences of consuming too much sugar. Or in the bottom, we see an ad, um, are you at risk of having stroke, encouraging people to come in for a workshop and a screening. And so these approaches are beneficial. They have their place, and people should be taking responsibility for their health. But these early efforts fell short because they have some limitations. They can be resource intensive. They can be inefficient. So focusing on one-on-one -on -one approaches, getting people to come in for screenings and then follow up through the medical care system and change their lifestyle. It's just not efficient when you consider how prevalent chronic disease is in the population. Ultimately, they're too narrow focused by just boiling it down to individual choice and making sure people know what the right thing to do is, especially when you consider that maintaining lifestyle changes can be hard, in particular in certain environments, which I'll be getting into later in the, uh, in the presentation. So while they have their place, um, they simply aren't enough and chronic disease remains prevalent. What we need instead is a systems approach where we look at the interrelated factors surrounding chronic disease in order um, to properly understand the causes and address the causes of chronic disease. Now to introduce the idea of systems, I'd like to start with a video I was introduced to in Australia called How Wolves Change Rivers. So for those of you who are joining us online, we are going to now open up a separate window to watch this video, which is actually sourced from YouTube. So I have the link there. I don't know how the video is going to work across the, the internet here. So I'm warning you in advance that uh, you may lose us while the video plays, but I'm hoping that it works properly. Okay. Thank you, James. So that was a clear example of a complex system and how systems may behave. And it highlighted some characteristics of systems, whether national parks or health systems or even cities. So uh, systems are self-organizing. System dynamics arise from the internal structure of the system. They're constantly changing, adjusting, and readjusting at different time scales. They're tightly linked. So because of high connectivity, changes in subsystems can have effects on other systems. They're governed by feedback, positive or negative responses to different effects. They're nonlinear, so we can't just place relationships on a simple input output line. They're history dependent. Short term changes can differ from long term changes, and there can be time delays in the system. Counterintuitive, so cause and effect can be distant in space and time, and the systems may behave in ways you wouldn't predict. And resistant to change, seemingly obvious solutions may not address the problem or may make things worse. So we saw that in the video, right? People had tried to control the population of the deer, but simply killing the deer wasn't enough. They needed the wolves to not just kill the deer, but also change their behavior and kill other animals. 
and leave behind carcasses and so on. And it was all these effects that together created ripples throughout the system. And then some of those effects reinforced the actions of the wolves, for example, the bears. And then ultimately, because of the high connectivity of it all, the ecosystem regenerated and the physical geography changed. The rivers changed their behavior. So we can use systems thinking to work within complex systems. Systems thinking involves dynamic thinking, looking for patterns of behavior over time. System is cause thinking, so placing responsibility for behavior on the structure of the system. Forest thinking as opposed to tree thinking. So looking at the context of relationships instead of just focusing on details. Operational thinking, so looking for causality, how behaviors are generated in a system. And loop thinking, understanding that causality is an ongoing process. Now there are systems tools that we can use to support us in systems thinking. We have systems maps and simulation modeling. So system maps are great for visually representing systems. So we can start to identify causal links and understand how a system may behave. So here's an example looking at open space in a community. We see different key variables laid out and connected by arrows. Uh, an arrow with a plus sign means a reinforcing effect. An arrow with a minus sign means a negative effect. And we can start at the top left for this one. So there will, in this case, there's a desire for outdoor activities. That would increase the extent of open space in the community because people would want more space to be active. That would in turn increase the popularity of a neighborhood, which would increase uh, the demand for new housing. Um, the parallel lines mean there's a time delay in the system. And then the demand for new housing would increase pressure to develop that open space, which would in turn decrease the extent of open space in the community. So this shows a balancing or a negative feedback loop and a case where we would see policy resistance because of that inherent contradiction between wanting more open space but more there. Here's another example that's a little more complex, looking at obesity. So we, can start, so we can start at the top left, we see extent of the obesity problem. That would increase the popularity of weight loss programs, which would in turn decrease the obesity problem in a balancing or negative feedback loop. But the popularity of weight loss programs would also decrease efforts to address underlying drivers of obesity, because people would just rely on these programs instead of getting at the root causes. And efforts to address these underlying drivers would decrease the power of these underlying drivers. So as efforts decrease, the power would increase. Again, there's these parallel lines representing the time delay. And the power of the underlying drivers of obesity would be reinforced by Western urban culture and urban population. So things like urban sprawl would increase commuting time, which may decrease time spent being active. And that all would in turn increase the extent of the obesity problem in a reinforcing or positive feedback loop. So we see a case where short-term fixes can lead to long-term failure. So these maps are great. So we can identify causal links in a system. We can identify feedback loops and counterintuitive behavior. And importantly, they're often developed with multiple stakeholders. So we'll get people together from different sectors and disciplines um, in order to get different perspectives and hopefully a comprehensive list of the key variables related to the target problem. Then from there, we can use computer modeling to simulate system behavior. So often people will start with a system map and then use that to develop a simulation model. So this is a screenshot from a modeling program showing an agent-based population model showing births and deaths in a population, uh, just to show what the program would look like. In the top left, picture, we see different dots representing different members of the population. On the right, we have a pyramid chart showing the ages in the population. And on the bottom, we have population dynamics over time. And of course, we can build much more complex models, um, in fact, representing whole systems, and the program will play it out for you. So this is great because we can quantify the behavior of a system and identify short and long-term behavior. And we can identify trends, costs, and risks associated with different possible interventions. So it's a great risk-free way to uh, see how different interventions would have an effect on your system. So now with that, what does chronic disease look like when we use a systems lens? So we saw a bit with that obesity example. 
um, but actually it can be much more complex. So the Foresight program in the UK looked at obesity through a systems lens because obesity impairs, obesity impairs people's quality of life and because um, it's a risk factor for conditions like heart disease and diabetes. And they used the systems approach because they recognized that it's complex and there weren't really any policies or strategies to properly address it. So in their work, they developed this comprehensive map um, around obesity, which is a little bit overwhelming. We see there's a lot of factors going on there. So let's break it down a bit. At the center, we have the central engine, which centers around the energy balance of an individual or a community. And it basically centers around how much energy we consume or expand or preserve. And then around that, we have factors grouped into these thematic clusters. Closest to the uh, central engine, we have individual psychology and biology. So that would be factors like stress levels or your metabolism. We have food consumption and individual activity. So for example, your portion sizes or how often you engage in recreational activity. And then beyond that, we have the activity environment. So are there parks nearby where you can be active? Or food production, how expensive is food for you? There's also societal influences. So the food advertising that you're exposed to. So we can see that there's a lot of factors going on. And with this perspective, we can start to understand why early efforts, while they have their place and they're important, they simply aren't enough because they don't address all the factors related to obesity or related conditions. So consider, I may understand that I need to eat healthy, but maybe I'm a student, so I can't afford much fresh produce. Or may, I may understand that I need to be active, but maybe there aren't parks nearby and maybe my neighborhood isn't very safe at night to go for walks. So there are these practical barriers that can uh, get in the way of us changing our lifestyle uh, as we would like. So we can use systems maps like this to understand what's going on around chronic disease and use that to develop possible interventions. So that's what the Foresight program did. They used this uh, work to actually develop a list of possible policy interventions. They were able to narrow it down to a select few that they thought had the range and depth to sustainably make an impact. And so what are some of the ways that uh, we can support lifestyle change? For my master's, I did a scholarly paper on eco-health, ecosystems approaches to health. So I focused on things in the environment that we can do to make a population level impact in supporting healthier lifestyles. In particular, I looked at healthy recreation, healthy transportation, and healthy nutrition. So starting with recreation, this is a picture of Stanley Park in Vancouver, which is this huge green space. It's a really great place for people to go out and walk, to ride their bikes, you can play sports on the grass. There's also a bike lane along the water that extends beyond the park to other parts of the city. So it's just a lovely place to go out and be active. So one thing we can do is encourage green spaces like Stanley Park to promote physical activity. So people have a place where they can go out and be active. Importantly, they need to be accessible. Fewer people will use them if they're hard to get to. They have to be usable. It's not just enough to have green space um, close by. Uh, it also has to be of sufficient size and quality so people can actually use it to be active. And ideally, they have to be safe as well. So that can mean making sure there's lighting at nighttime or separation from traffic and so on. Also, green spaces provide additional benefits for human health and the environment. So there are psychological benefits because they promote social interaction and um, nature can be relaxing. They provide some contrast from the perceived busyness of urban areas. For the environment, they also help cool cities. So cities are usually hotter than surrounding rural areas because of what's called the urban heat island effect. Basically because of all the concrete and asphalt, asphalt cities get hotter. So green spaces can be a way to help cool cities. They also can act as carbon sinks because of all the vegetation. So that can help with high um, carbon emissions and improve air quality. So we're seeing a lot of benefits as well all at once. We can also support healthy transportation. So this is a picture of a laneway in Melbourne. Now, Melbourne's a great city because it's really walkable. It's really easy to get everywhere by foot, and it's also really pleasant. They have these interesting laneways. 
They have lots of cafes, restaurants, and shops, so people enjoy going out and walking. So, as in Melbourne, we can use city design to facilitate active modes of transportation so that we're getting our physical activity in our daily routines that we have to do anyway. And there's evidence to suggest that being physically active in our daily routines can be as beneficial as structured aerobic exercise for health benefits. So as in Melbourne, we can increase walkability, make sure things are within walking distance, make sure there are a sufficient number of uh, footpaths. And we can also use city design to support enjoyable and safe neighborhoods. Again, Melbourne is a nice place to walk around so people enjoy it. And we can make sure it's safe, um, for example, providing lighting or separation from traffic so that people are comfortable going out and in walking places. We can also support cycling. So this is a picture um, from Amsterdam in the Netherlands where there's a big cycling culture and they have the infrastructure to support it, like this bike lane. So we can introduce bike lanes to support cycling. And ideally, again, they would be made as safe as possible, perhaps providing um, some separation from traffic so people are more comfortable going out and riding their bike to get places. There are also other things we can do to make it easier. For example, workplaces can make it easier to bike to work by providing bike racks or bike repair kits. Or at uh, the Sachs Institute, the building where we worked, they actually have showers so people can ride their bike in the morning and then shower and feel comfortable for the day. So these little things we can do to support um, healthy transportation. We can also look to public transport. So these are the trains in Sydney that we took everywhere. And it was really interesting to see in myself how easy it is to change your habits once the alternative becomes the easier option. So here in Hamilton, Hamilton is designed for cars. It's by far the easiest way to get around. And I prefer to drive everywhere when I can. Um, but in Sydney, I didn't have a car. And while, of course, many people still drive, they have this pretty great train system. Um, it's pretty accessible. It has a really extensive reach. So it just became the easiest way to get around. And just like that, I found myself um, taking the train places. So we can invest in public transport. And the active part comes in when people have to walk um, to the train station when they're going home or to work instead of just stepping right outside to their car. And while that may mean just a few extra minutes walking for some people, on a population level, it can translate into benefits. And again, all these active modes of transportation provide additional benefits for human health and the environment. So they would reduce traffic, which means less noise pollution. It also um, reduce carbon emissions, which means improved air quality. So we're getting a lot of benefits at once. Lastly, we can support healthy nutrition. So this is a picture from Queen Victoria's Market in Melbourne, which is this great, huge market where there's lots of fresh produce. They also have things like meats and cheeses and so on. Um, so it's just a really accessible, really great place to get good food. So we can increase the prevalence of farmers markets and supermarkets, which is associated with um, an increase in fruit and vegetable intake. We can also make sure they're accessible so combining with the transportation efforts, making sure um, they're uh, accessible by foot. And we can also use other strategies like placing regulations on fast food restaurants, like where they're located, um, all to make sure that eating healthy becomes the easiest, most convenient option. Now, there are some challenges with actually implementing these changes. And there are two in particular that I see. Um, one, so we have here a picture of New York City, and as we can see, it's already all built up. So how can we work around existing infrastructure? I mean, we can't just move a skyscraper back five or ten feet to open up a sidewalk, right? Well, here's another picture of New York, where they transformed a city street to open it up to pedestrians and cyclists. So we can repurpose or transform what already exists. We can do as Melbourne, is, or sorry, as New York City has done here. Um, or for green space, we can repurpose uh, land that's poorly maintained or not really used. We can also look to rooftops for possible green spaces. And doing so will require innovative and systems thinking. We'll have to be creative about how we can work around what we already have. 
and um, we'll need systems thinking to understand how these interventions will have impacts on our cities, which um, are themselves systems. The other main problem I see is accessibility. So this is a picture of Melbourne CBD, which, as I've mentioned, is very walkable. They've got Queen Victoria's Market. The tram is free within the CBD. And across this bridge to the right of the picture, there's a huge green space, the Botanic Gardens. So it's really lovely, really livable. Um, it's actually been ranked one of the most livable cities in the world for many years. Uh, but I came across an interesting article in Australia that said, sure, Melbourne is livable, but livable for who? Because Melbourne CBD is really, exp uh, really expensive. So it's out of reach for a lot of people. And these changes I've been suggesting, like increasing green space, raise the retail value of areas, which can be seen as a good thing, but it does pe push people further away who are of lower socioeconomic status and already disproportionately um, affected by chronic disease. So while we have to make these changes, we have to support equity for all so that um, we can all benefit from these changes. And again, this will require systems thinking, looking at the big picture and how we can um, support everyone from benefiting from these livable communities that we want. And now, how do we make it all work? Systems thinking, these preventive efforts. From all, my, uh, all the seminars I attended and all the conversations I had with researchers, I realized that it really comes down to data and collaboration. So to start with data, this is a picture of GIS, Geographic Information Systems, which researchers are starting to use to look at things like walkability of communities and how we can improve walkability. So data like this is great because we need data to better understand the systems we're working in so that our decisions can be informed by evidence. Also, simulation models depend on data in order to have um, a reliable predictive power. So when researchers develop simulation models, ideally they um, draw numbers from the literature. So for example, effect sizes between variables. But where the data aren't there, they have to make their best guess. And ideally, they can get an expert in on that. And unfortunately, the right data are not always available. And that's what makes systems work so hard in the health field. As we saw with that systems map around obesity, there are a lot of factors going on. But we just don't have all the right data. And also, sometimes that data can be hard to get. So for example, you may want to look at eating patterns and then one possible way to do that might be to look at purchasing trends at grocery stores. But that's actually sensitive information for some businesses who may be reluctant to share it. Or even if you could get that information, well, how do you know that people are actually um, eating that food? Because maybe they're uh, throwing away some of the food. And so there's room for error there, right? But research is helping fill the gap. So for example, the Prevention Center has many research projects going on looking at systems work and preventive efforts. Um, one study in particular actually is the was the National Livability Study that I got to learn about in Melbourne, uh, where they're looking at these different domains of livability that I've been talking about, like green space and walkability. Now, that is also really important because systems work involves continual evaluation and adaptation, because systems are always changing, and we want to make sure we're on the right track. Now, to do that well, you need to regularly collect data, for example, monthly instead of yearly, because a lot of these population-level changes take place on a, long, on a large time scale, for example, decades. But waiting decades is too long to make sure that your interve intervention is on the right track. So by collecting data regularly and early, you can identify early successes, determine the trajectory of your work, and adapt accordingly. Um, it also depends on collaboration. Um, systems work often looks, uh, starts off looking like that picture where people from different disciplines are gathered around with uh, sticky notes and posters and figuring out the different variables related to a system and drawing out systems maps. And this kind of collaboration is necessary because systems are complex. So we have to approach the problem from multiple angles. 
but one organization couldn't do that alone. It would be overwhelming. So we need collaboration between organizations. Through forming partnerships, organizations can um, focus on their expertise and be targeted in their approach, and then altogether they can work in a unified way. So, for example, that national livability study, they had researchers from each state um, focus on a different domain of livability, and then they came together to get a fuller picture of livability. We also need to bridge different, se different sectors which may be difficult. So as we've seen, health depends on things beyond the health system, beyond the health sector. Uh, for example, you may want to increase walkability or public transport, and that would require talking to the transportation sector. But the health sector and transportation sector have traditionally been separate, working as separate silos is the term people use. And it can be hard to bridge that just because of how things have always been. Um, but also, people in, in the transportation sector may not um, want to take on the additional responsibilities of considering health when really their focus is efficient transportation. Or indeed, they may not appreciate the value of systems work or preventive health. So efforts will need to be made to bridge different sectors. We also need collaboration between researchers and policymakers to translate knowledge into action. So again, this is something the Prevention Center is focusing on. Well, researchers and policymakers need to understand each other's needs. So for example, they work on different yearly timelines. And policymakers have a lot of things um, to balance. So for them, I learned evidence doesn't just mean research evidence. It also means opinions, and it also means opinions and experiences of stakeholders. And those are things they have to take into account. So researchers need to understand that reality. There's also um, cost that policymakers have to consider. So funding can be a big barrier to implementing different preventive efforts. Um, so researchers need to consider the feasibility of different projects. And then also generally, it's important to work across different levels. So uh, researchers may have ideas of you know, increasing walkability of a city, um, but policymakers often will work at the level of one project at a time. So they may understand, okay, we need to incre increase walkability. So what does that mean, for example, do we put one sidewalk or two sidewalks on these roads in this community? So working from those big conceptual levels down to individual projects to actually make those changes. And co-production is one way to help bridge research and policy. In co-production, both researchers and policymakers are involved in the development of research projects. And this is uh, really beneficial for later implementing that research into policy. Lastly, we need collaboration with the community. We need to engage the community during problem definition and project development uh, because community members will more likely accept and participate in interventions if they feel that it really meets their needs and that they were a part of its creation. So community engagement will increase the chances of success for our interventions. And with that, I would like to end again with a picture of lovely Sydney and just uh, recap saying chronic disease is widespread and the causes are complex. But with systems thinking and tools, we can understand and address these causes. And doing so successfully will depend on having the right data and collaboration between different organizations and sectors, between researchers and policymakers, and with the community. I'd like to thank the McMaster Health Forum and the Queen Elizabeth, Scho Elizabeth Scholarship Program for this incredible opportunity. And I'd like to thank all the staff at the Sachs Institute and the Prevention Center, in particular, my supervisor, Dr. Shauna Davidson and Jackie Stevenson for supporting me in my learning during the internship. They were really great with supporting my work and helping me find um, opportunities to attend seminars and meet with researchers, which were really great learning opportunities. So thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. So uh, we'll let everybody just kind of relax for a second. A lot of information to digest. Um, but we'll open the room to questions. And those of you who are online, I would ask if you have a question, please type it in the chat box. 
Uh, so what I'll do is I'll ask you the first question to give everybody a chance to think about it. So, uh, you know, the overarching topic that you were looking at was lifestyle-related chronic disease. So uh, having never been to Australia, I don't know a lot about the Australian culture and uh, the lifestyles that they live. So I'm curious if you could tell us, uh, when you compare Australians to Canadians, what is there any major differences in terms of what the lifestyle-related chronic diseases might be? So what what lifestyle choices might lead, might be different in both uh, jurisdictions? Okay, yeah, good question. Um, so in general, I found that people in Sydney are a little more outdoorsy, and of course they have a big surfing culture there. Um, so there are those differences, but um, despite that, there are a lot of similarities. So like a lot of people there do drive, like we do here, um, I mean, that's why chronic disease is uh, widespread in Australia as it is here, because a lot of it is the same in terms of the Western urban culture, where, um, you know, there's urban sprawl, people drive places, um, we're more sedentary than we used to be, especially at work. Um, so there are those similarities. I think, I mean, the main differences I noticed were that... Um, they, they do have a better train system. Um, there seem to be some really good bike lanes that were actually separate from traffic. Um, so there were some changes like that, but overall I found there were a lot of similarities just in the sense of the Western urban environment. Yeah. Thank you very much. We have a question. Well, here's the question. I was just wondering how you think we can improve our cities from a systems lens without drastically increasing housing prices? So that's a really good question. Um, that's particularly relevant for cities, the big cities. So like Sydney is actually an extremely, place to, extremely expensive place to live. Um, same with Melbourne. And so these places are already really expensive. And um, I don't think there's a simple answer. That's why we need systems work. Uh, one thing that I think is worth looking at is, so cities may be expensive and stay expensive, but the suburban areas are normally where it's um, cheaper to live. And suburban areas are usually less livable because of the reliance on cars and urban sprawl. There's less of that infrastructure to support you know, walkability and so on. So one strategy might not be um, trying to make cities less expensive per se, although I think that would be really important, but making these other places um, more livable in other ways, like suburban areas that are already um, cheaper, um, cheaper, just making sure they're livable as our urban centers are. <coughs> Thank you. So I'll look at the people in the room and ask if anybody has any questions for Chris. So yeah, go ahead. question in the room comes from somebody who has a sibling who lives in Australia, and the point here is being that it, it seems to be a nicer climate, uh, more temperate, easier to get outdoors and be active, and is that an issue that apparently you're, you're applying that Canada doesn't have such a climate? Is that what you're saying? Uh, so maybe climate has an, uh, is related to these factors. Yeah. So that's one thing we, uh, we, we were kind of jealous of, visiting Sydney. Um, in the wintertime, it got to like 10 degrees, and that's it. So it is possible to be um, very active there all year round. Um, although the, the flip side is that the summers get really hot, and you actually like can't run except in like the evening time, or else it's, it's too hot. I remember talking to someone there who was saying that. So, yeah, that's another problem for like... For example, here, um, having bike lanes and all is great, but in the wintertime, you need, I mean, like, is it safe? Or you need to make sure um, that there's sufficient snow removal and stuff so that people can actually walk around and ride their bikes. So I think it's still possible. Like in, in the Netherlands, for example, there's a big cycling culture, and I understand that it rains a lot there, um, but they still get out and do it. And that's part of the, the culture that comes with it too, where people are just like, I'm gonna cycle anyway because it's the easiest way. And yeah, I think we can look into things like, like snow removal and so on to make sure that it is safe year round. So we'll do another question in the room and then we'll go online, so go ahead. 
So the question in the room has to do with um, collaborations between researchers and policymakers, and so that they understand each other. And what do you think the issues are now, and how we can encourage that in the future? Okay, great question. Um, so yeah, big. There's a the big movement towards co-production, um, where researchers and policymakers are involved from the beginning. I think a lot of it comes down to just getting them together and. Um, Getting, to, getting them to have conversations. So I went to uh, a network meeting with the Prevention Center where they brought researchers and policies together um, just to even informally have a conversation. And then also a policymaker gave a presentation just to start to understand each other's needs. And then, um, yeah, ideally opening up ways for them to actually work together and Continue that work. Continue that work. Um, I'm, I'm not sure of any like, you know, if we need like a new body or something like organizational body to bring them together. Um, but organizations like the Prevention Center and um, the McMaster Health Forum are involved in um, already bridging those two worlds. So I think continuing in those ways would be good. So we'll go uh, online to one of our Queen Elizabeth scholars who's currently abroad. Uh, and she wants to know of the various lifestyle change approaches that you mentioned throughout your presentation, which ones do you think are feasible or can be adapted into Hamilton's current infrastructure? And I'll expand that a little bit from a more health systems element to maybe the Ontario uh, provincial structure. Okay. Um, so the things I focused on were recreation, transportation, and nutrition. I think what I think in Hamilton is we have a lot of potential and we already have some of those things in place. It's just a matter of increasing access to what's already there. So we do have, for example, Gage Park, which is this pretty big green space um, that I, I don't think a lot of people know about or know how to get to. We also have a farmer's market downtown, but I think like, for example, a lot of students at Mac will prefer to go to Fortino's. Um, or may, may not even know about the farmer's market. I think, I mean, I think they all can apply. There's also for public transportation, there's, um, I mean, there's a lot going on. They're introducing more bike lanes. There's a new program called Bike for Mike, getting students to bike to schools. There's talk about introducing LRT. Um, I think they're all feasible, and I think they can all be adapted because a lot of the pieces are already there, and it's just a matter of making it all work together. Yeah. Thank you. And another question in the room. So one of the Queen Elizabeth scholars in the room, who's going to Kenya next year, uh, would like to know about simulation modeling and what the limitations are about that. Good question. Um, I, think, I think the main limitation comes down to the, having the data. So when you're making predictions, you need previous data to see trends. Um, and when it's not there, you, you have to make guesses, uh, ideally your best possible guess. Um, I, think, I think that's a big limitation, but that will go away with time as we start to look more into systems work and, and um, gathering more data. Um, yeah, I think that's the main point because, I mean, I didn't learn too much about actually making these systems models, but it seems like there, there is a lot of flexibility in what you can actually create and that they're improving too like to actually have like simulate sort of like sims I think you know the video game like they're simulating like whole systems and cities and yeah so there's a lot of potential there. Great thank you. So we have a question from another Queen, one of our Queen Elizabeth scholars online uh, wanting to know about the obesity systems map. Uh, it showed a multifactorial nature of the disease but it was quite complex. Do you think that knowledge translation is compromised through such a complicated systems map? Ooh, good question. Um, is it complicated through, or compromised through such a complicated systems map? Well, I think it, it's a matter of distilling it down to key points. Also, um, in systems work, you look at leverage points. So certain things in the system that have, where a small change can lead to a big impact. And so I think by like focusing on those things and having someone who can who knows about the research and policy worlds, they can really help um, 
bridge that and uh, you know take those insights from these maps and um, translate it for for policymakers. Um, also, I don't think it would be necessarily compromised because of the different. If you remember the different thematic clusters, so you know you would be working with a policymaker from the transportation sector, so you would focus on the activity environment, right? And so that sort of simplifies it in a way. Thank you. Any other questions from anybody in the room? Yeah, go ahead. From being in Australia, so what did you learn in Australia that you wouldn't have gotten if you hadn't gone? Um, so what I'm not sure I would have gone if I gotten if I hadn't gone to Australia was actually all this insight into systems work. Um, so it was interesting because we don't quite have something like the Prevention Center using you know having the title of systems approaches here in Canada. But I remember speaking to a researcher there who had spent eight years working here in Canada, and he said he learned a lot of um, a lot about systems work from different researchers. It was sort of like already ingrained into a lot of our researchers. Um, whereas there, they have this sort of what seems like a more top-down approach, where they have this prevention center that's using systems work and trying to disseminate it. And for me, that was really beneficial to sort of like operationalize systems work for me and see like what it looks like and how we can apply it to these different uh, different areas. So yeah, I think that was something that surprised me and was really great to learn. Any other questions for anybody online? Yeah, or in the room, go on your work on you know understanding what um, chronic disease is all about. How has it changed your personal perspective on global health and global disease? Um, well, I think they sort of go together because in my master's I, I studied uh, global health and we touched on all these different things related to health. Um, so it sort of went together where I now realize that there really are a lot of things going on and importantly it includes things beyond the health system. So I remember in one of our classes in um, my master's program, we had a guest speaker come in who said, sometimes in global health, the most important people aren't actually doctors. It's the people who can bring fresh water and make sure there's access to healthy food and so on. And so, I mean, it sort of went together. It's not that one made me think about the other differently. It's just I thought about them now both in this sort of big picture, holistic thinking sort of way. Any other questions from anybody in the room or online? So I'm going to take the silence and the lack of typing as uh, everybody's content. Um, so again, I, I want to thank everybody for joining us, those of you who came uh, here to the Health Forum today, and those of you who joined us online. Uh, if you look at the title, the slide that's on the, the screen right now, that first link is uh, a link to our scholarship program. If you want more information about how to apply and what it's all about, that's the link you'd go to. Uh, the second link is uh, a list of all of our current uh, scholars webinars, which has uh, a schedule of when they will be occurring, links to the webinars, and uh, all of our scholars will then also be writing blog posts to talk about their experiences when they are abroad. And that third link will take you to our blog page where uh, we will slowly be getting those blog posts up. We're a little bit behind on that, but we will, we will get blogs from everybody who does a presentation and everybody who has uh, been abroad for us. Uh, so thank you very much, Chris, for being here today. We, uh, we enjoyed it, and thank you, everybody, for joining us, and I hope to see you again next time. Thank you. Thanks, guys.